Um, good morning, uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you, dear prof, doctors, including all the residents and fellow who had joined the Zoom. It is good to see you all after the long eight holiday. So today we held the Australian Indonesian Joint Lecture Series, and this is the first session of this year. And unlike our sessions in the previous years, from now on we will not only cover the glaucoma topics, but also include other subspecialties. So tonight we will have a case of diabetic retinopathy from one of our retina fellow, Dr. Samsul Rizal, as well as a related lecture from Prof. Hassam Razavi, the retina consultants from the Lions Eye Institute. And luckily, we also have some of our retina consultants from the Chipto Mangunkusumo Hospital, which will enliven our discussion today. So without further ado, I invite Dr. Samsul to present uh, his case. Please, the time is yours. Uh, thank you, Dr. Arki, for having me. Uh, good evening, everyone. Good evening, dear professors, uh, doctors, and also residents, and also fellows who joined this meeting. Uh, tonight, I will present uh, cases uh, about uh, diabetic macular edema patient. And after actually a few cases, maybe one or two cases, and after I read one cases, maybe we'll have uh, a discussion and I will uh, leave it to the uh, moderator. So uh, let me share my videos, uh, my screen. Thank you. Can you see my screen, everyone? Yes, clearly. Okay. So, uh, thank you to my supervisor, Professor Andy, uh, Dr. Ari, Dr. Gita, and Dr. Anggun, and also Dr. Mario, uh, for having me to let me uh, present these cases uh, tonight. So, the first case is a uh, male, uh, 51 years old, with uh, Malay ethnicity. Uh, he is a cruise ship crew based on overseas. He, he has a type 2 diabetes mellitus and treated with insulin injection routinely. Uh, he came with a, a complaint with a blur vision of both eyes. Uh, and initial DCVA is a 3 meter counting finger on the right eye and 0 0.2 on the left eye. We also noticed that the, he has a grade 2 nuclear cataract and also a posterior uh, subcapsular haziness. After we performed the clinical examination, uh, we found that, uh, there's, uh, you can see in the picture, uh, there's a hemorrhage also, a lot of uh, uh, exudate, and also we performed the OCT. Uh, we diagnosed the patient with a severe, uh, sorry, with severe uh, non proliferative diabetic retinopathy, retinopathy with diabetic macular edema. As we can see from the OCT, we found that uh, the central macular thickness is over 600 for both eyes. So, uh, what about the treatment? We decided to give him a loading dose with three intravitreal anti VEGF. Uh, which is uh, a valibar step injection on both eyes. And also, uh, we perform the panretinal photocoagulation laser on both eyes. And also, we consider to do the cataract extraction on both eyes. After uh, first injection, uh, which is uh, three months after the initial visit, we can see we take the picture of the uh, fundus and also we perform the uh, OCT again and we found a quite a remarkably result of the uh, clinical find. We found that there is a decreasing in hemorrhage and also from the uh, OCT we found that uh, the edema is resolved and also there's a 
uh, improvement in visual acuity, which is uh, 612 on the right eye and 630 on the left eye. And the patient is, uh, unfortunately, after uh, completing the, uh, sorry, yes, after completing the uh, three injection of the uh, loading dose, uh, six months after the initial, initial visit, uh, he came again with a blur eye in both eyes and also developed a diabetic foot and also a severe kidney disease that need a hemodialysis. Uh, we performed the OCT again and we found there's a, a edema on the right eye, right eye, with 600 or more. And on the left eye, actually, the uh, edema is not a very, uh, actually, it's not, there's no edema. But the visual acuity on the, the especially on the right eye is decreasing. So uh, what about the treatment after we found that the patient has uh, uh, having a blood fusion again? We choose to give him uh, one dose of intravitreal, uh, a free bercept injection on both eyes. And after the fourth injection of Aflibercep, we can see the edema is dissolved, but the visual acuity, uh, especially on the left eye, is still decreasing. And we, uh, we, didn't, uh, we didn't do any uh, more injection for this patient, but uh, we uh, decided to follow up the patient. And for the next visit, one month, first injection on both eyes, we found that uh, all the uh, edema was dissolving and the visual acuity is uh, uh, improving. So after this uh, result, we decided to uh, do the follow up and didn't give any more, uh, didn't plan for uh, more injection for this patient. So I think uh, that's the first case. Uh, first case. Uh, maybe I, I give back to Dr. Ati. Maybe if there are any uh, comment or question uh, for discussion. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Samsul. I'm aware that Dr. Samsul has uh, prepared more than one cases, but I think even in this first case, it's quite uh, very interesting, and I hope we can discuss a uh, lot from this case. So maybe while waiting for questions uh, in the chat box, um, may I invite uh, the consultants, maybe Dr. Gita Lisa or Dr. Mario, to give a concise command regarding the case? Um. Yes, Dr. Mita, maybe I'd uh, like to add uh, a bit regarding this case. Uh, uh, the reason why, uh, yes, I think in the, the after he finished this, uh, his loading dose on both eyes and also uh, a PRP laser was performed. Uh, yeah, this happens to be my patient. Uh, he Because of his job, he has to uh, go overseas again. Yeah, and that uh, also uh, maybe uh, hinders the uh, regular control in this patient. So the last time he came, uh, the macular edema uh, uh, recurred again. Yeah, and also uh, I think uh, the ideal treatment would be uh, probably we do a, a close monitoring and PRN or fit and extend, but in this case, it was not possible because he was abroad, yeah, so it's uh, it was difficult to treat him. And also, uh, after the last treatment, uh, we didn't manage to follow, follow him up again. And uh, of course, his systemic condition has become worse. Yeah, he, uh, last time uh, I checked, he need hemodialysis, di dialysis. So um, yeah, unfortunately, we cannot do a, a long-term follow-up uh, on this case. So 
Yeah, maybe Professor uh, Razafi or Prof Morgan has further comments or maybe similar uh, experiences regarding this. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gita. Uh, Prof Razavi, do you have any comment or opinion? Wonder um, why maybe the um, the aflibercept become the first um, chosen treatment in this particular patient. Sorry, are you asking me or? Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. for the question, maybe Dr. Gita yeah. regarding the right. choice of uh medicine, Dr. Gita, yes. the agent. Do you have oh. any? special consideration yes i think uh, uh evidence from trials uh uh point out that aflibercept has a a superior effect on diabetic macular edema i, I mean all anti agents uh based on our experience and also uh, uh lit, uh, the publications uh, show a positive effect in uh, the treatment of dme but uh, I think in this case, because the patient is covered by insurance, also it is an international uh, ship uh, shipping company, uh, 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 well known. Then we can afford to give him the best. Probably, uh, I think a flavor step was possible at the time, so that's why uh, we chose we we have chosen a flavor step as. Uh, first, first line treatment. Thank yeah. you, Gita. Yeah, maybe. Have, um, yeah, maybe comments from. <laughs> yes, can I have okay. comments from Prof. Razafi? Yeah, Do you have sure. any like different opinion or else regarding the case? Yeah, challenging case because there was uh, severe diabetic macular edema and quite advanced diabetic retinopathy, plus cataract. This is sort of the worst combination. And I wonder if there was some vitreous hemorrhage early on in the piece because the ocular media didn't seem clear and it was it's hard to tell whether that's lens opacity or vitreous hemorrhage or both. So I would also have chosen a flubicept, I agree with you. And um, you referred to the yeah the, the evidence suggesting that a flubicept in these patients is superior when the visual acuity is 615 or worse at the time of presentation. So there's this... Global Research Group, DRCRNet, you may have heard of them. Mm -hmm. And so they've done all the landmark clinical trials in management of diabetic macular edema. And one of the results they showed was that the three anti-VEGF agents are actually all very similar until the DMO becomes worse and the vision is worse at presentation. When the DMO is worse and the vision is worse, then a flibercept outperforms the other two. It outperforms bevacizumab and ranibizumab by at least five letters on the Snellen chart, at least. So that's a meaningful difference, right? I think it was something like six letters. So for that reason, I think most of us in Australia would start with a flibercept. Then you've got the issue of loss to follow-up, which we also have here in Australia, right, where you can't see the patient regularly because they're not there, they're travelling, et cetera. We have our version of that here in Western Australia, because it's a very big state, so you can't necessarily see everybody every month, the long distances. So an alternative that we use sometimes, if we have to, it's definitely not first line, it would be second line, is intravitreal steroid, where we think, oh, I might not see this person again for a few months, who knows. As you know, steroid has its own side effects. So the cataract will need to be removed and intraocular pressure needs to be monitored. So they're the risks with using steroid. Um, but that's something we do here, especially if they're pseudophagic already. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Prof. And um, for the steroid, do you like um, inject it like in combination or single? No, so generally, generally it's single. There have been some trials where they've attempted to combine mm -hmm. or alternate steroid and anti-VEGF. Mm -hmm. So the clinical trial, that we there's a steroid implant that's approved for use in Australia, the dexamethasone implant. Uh, the trade name is Ozudex. It's a, it's a very small little 700 microgram implant goes in the vitreous. Um, they've tried alternating that with bevacizumab. 
didn't really show superiority over steroid alone. Uh, so I generally will use it on its own, but the requirement here is either the patient is pseudophagic or they have to be waitlisted for cataract surgery. Mm. Yeah. So you have to have that uh, access to surgery. Okay. Uh, okay, thank you very much, Prof. I think due to time, uh, we should proceed first uh, to your lecture, Prof. Uh, so I'm aware that you will uh, bring the topic uh, tonight. The lecture title is The Clinical Evaluation and Management of Diabetic Retinopathy and Diabetic Macular Indema in the Real World. So please, you have uh, about 30 minutes to present your lecture. So I'll just try and share my screen if that's okay. Um, one minute while I do that. We'll try to do that. Um, apologies. Hmm. Can you see this share uh, screen? You know, button? I can, but it's it's asking me to open my settings and do difficult stuff. So uh, I'm going to try something else. Hmm. Sorry about this. I'll try one more time. So while waiting, I will remind the participants to feel free to send questions through the chat box. Or if you um, like to uh say your question yourself you can also raise your hand okay very sorry about this Artie, can i suggest if you have another um case perhaps you oh. present that one while i'm working okay. on this what do you think okay, okay yes yes i think that's okay i think dr samsung still have one more case dr samsung yeah mm -hmm. thank you mm -hmm. Okay, uh, the second case is a uh, male, 65 years old, with also uh, Malay ethnicity. Uh, he is a national bank retiree, uh, also have type 2 diabetes mellitus with, uh, treated with oral uh, medicine only, also a smoker, and he come with a blurred vision of both eyes with a discorrected visual acuity on the right eye is 6. Uh, 18 and also 618 on the left eye. We also found a grade one nuclear cataract. So after we take the picture and also do the OCT, uh, we diagnose the patient with severe, also with severe MPDR uh, with DME. With the central macular thickness is 500 on the right eye and 400 on the left eye. So we plan to give him a loading dose, uh, three uh, monthly injection of intravitreal ranibizumab and also uh, unretinal photocoagulation of both eyes. After uh, three dose of uh, ranibizumab, we found there's uh, no difference in 
edema on the positive, so but the visual acuity was still uh, 618 on both eyes. So what next? So we we choose to switch uh, the agent to aflibercept. But after uh, also three monthly injection of aflibercept and also an additional anti uh, injection elsewhere, uh, we still have uh, edema on the both eyes, but the visual acuity was still remain. So the problem is, uh, what should we do next? Uh, I think uh, that's the case for number two, Dr. Arti. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Samso. So um, can I have comments regarding the case? Maybe from Dr. Mario, if you are able to. Yes, thank you, Dr. Mita. Can you hear me? Yes, clearly, Dr. Is my voice audible? Yes. Um, yeah, for this uh, second case, I think, uh, yeah, uh, we should uh, also uh, uh, do the FFA if possible because uh, the visual equity is not uh, uh, improving after uh, uh, some of intravitreal injection uh, of all, uh, although the we already give the aflibercept also yeah three three monthly injections and uh, yeah I'm afraid uh, there is uh, the visual equity is not improving uh, because of maybe the macular uh, ischemia also so that's my concern Dr. Arti, Dr. Mita Okay. Uh, yeah. okay, thank you, Dr. Mario. Uh, regarding the edema itself, is it um, decreased or not, Dr. Samsung? I'm quite forgetting. Or not, not too significant? Uh, it's not changing. Not, to, not changing. After the second uh, uh, loading dose. Yeah, even the first uh, and the second uh, type of uh, agent. But it's no. also not worsening. worsening. Okay, okay. So um, maybe... Prof. Lazavi, do you um, have any comments or? Hmm? I have been busy in the background. All right. Okay. <laughs> Arty, what no, have, have I done? Have you solved it? No. Maybe uh, I can. Uh, ask yes. Doctor uh, Samsul, can can you show us the the last uh, OCT of the second case? Yes, this one. Uh, okay, so I think uh, regarding the the right eye, compared to the first one, there is some uh, improvement. Yeah, the, uh, uh, I found that uh, the uh, I observed that the macular thickness has decreased. Yeah, uh, qualitatively. Yeah, uh, I I don't see any uh, prominent intraretinal cysts or uh, fluid anymore. But yes, I agree with uh, Dr. Mario, yeah, to do a, probably it's better to do an FAA to rule out any ischemia. And also I think uh, we have to do a, a thorough clinical exam, yeah. And from the OCT here, I don't think it's very clear, but we also must rule out uh, the presence of PRMs, yeah, intraretinal, uh, epiretinal membrane, so that may also uh, uh, maybe worsen the the visual uh, outcomes in this patient. And also, of course, uh, we have to rule out cataract. Yeah, right. Thank you, Dr. Gita. If there is an uh, ERM, so would you like to suggest a surgery to... Uh, not yet. Maybe uh, if if uh, with three injections of anti fadgev is still not effective, we can always try because we see there's some improvement, uh, although it's uh, minimal. Maybe we can try to give uh, subsequent injections while doing a, a yeah, better do an FA also, yeah. And also if there's a, a cataract, we can do 
uh, cataract surgery. Yeah, I mean, basically, uh, we need to improve uh, the vision in this patient. Uh, so for the subsequent injection, what do you think um, you will give, Dr. Gita? Um, it can be anything or you try something that you uh, you haven't given to this patient before? Uh -huh. Yes, we, we can try with uh, the same agent. Yeah, I think uh, uh, when he was given aflibercept, there was some, uh, some uh, reduce uh, reducement of the uh, decreasing of the macular thickness. Uh, but then if maybe after uh, one, one, maybe one more injection, there's no effect, then we could try other alternatives yeah i think in indonesia there's uh the new newly launched uh anti vegf drug which is uh uh Ismol, yeah uh, i forgot the <laughs> generic name dr mario uh Fabismol is uh, uh farisimab uh, yeah yeah we, we, can, we, we have an alternative with farisimab or as doc uh, Professor uh, Razami uh, pointed out, we can try combination with steroids. Unfortunately, in Indonesia, we uh, have not, uh, the Alcerdex is not yet available. So I think we have to try with, we have to settle with uh, trimcinolon maybe. Yeah, of course, if there's a, a cataract, then we have to be ready to uh, put him on the, uh, plan for cataract surgery afterwards because probably it will uh, worsen or uh, make the cataract more more dense okay and also control of the eye pressure of course sorry yeah yeah thank you dr gita yeah. so uh professor v are you still busy no i i've no. just emailed my file to okay. one of your colleagues and i think they have ah. it so i'm happy to start if they can share the file Oh, okay, yes. Just just one mm -hmm. question, uh, Professor Zafi. Uh, how's your experience with the Ozordex? Um, do you find many patients with um, secondary glaucoma after that? Um, look, you get a proportion of ocular hypertension, which is somewhere between 25-30%. Mm -hmm. So let's say a quarter to a third of patients. Mm -hmm. Majority of those can be managed with topical drops only. So the so majority... Uh, won't go on to develop true glaucoma. It'll just be short-term ocular hypertension. So you've got two choices there. One is to discontinue the Ozudex and then the and treat the pressure temporarily with drops, and then it will return to normal. Mm -hmm. Most of those patients can then be taken off drops. The alternative is if you're stuck with steroid because anti-VEGF has absolutely failed, then you have to manage both. Mm -hmm. and, and a small proportion will go on to need um, incisional glaucoma surgery of some sort, whatever that is. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Mm. Thank you, Dr. Mario and Dr. Samsul. So we can uh, proceed to your uh, lecture, I think. Great. So shall I just ask for the slides to be progressed? Yes. Is that okay? Uh, yes. If I can uh, say that. Yes, right. Great. So we'll be talking about. So, firstly, apologies for the the um, delay. Uh, I have a new laptop and obviously not cooperating. So, what we hope to talk about tonight: diabetic retinopathy and diabetic macular edema. Very similar to the cases that you've presented. I think they're really good cases. So, let's talk about those. If you can get the next slide. So, I'll talk about clinical evaluation. There's a lot you can say about diabetic retinopathy, but um, I'll just focus on some key aspects. One is clinical evaluation, then management, and then we've got a couple of cases at the end. Next slide. So, let's talk about classification of DR. And if you start off the most simple, you know, the earliest stage of DR is microaneurysms only, right? So, that's mild non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy. I then like to jump from mild MPDR straight to severe. And severe should have one of the three following signs. Either they have four quadrants of intraretinal hemorrhages, and we used to say in the old days, at least 20 intraretinal hemorrhages, in addition to microaneurysms. 
nobody is going to sit there and count 20 hemorrhages. So to simplify that, you say four quadrants of intraretinal hemorrhages uh, or two quadrants of venous beating. And personally, this is the most useful sign to me because venous beating very often is visible uh, around the disc, so a peripapillary area. So if you go to the veins at the disc, you can quite quickly see in the posterior pole whether there's venous beating or not, or uh, one quadrant of Irma or intraretinal microvascular abnormality. So if they have at least one of these, that's severe in PDR. Now, if you're anywhere between microaneurysms, if you have more than microaneurysms, but you don't have one of these signs of severe MPDR, then by definition, you have moderate MPDR. So things like a few hemorrhages or cotton wool spots, that's likely to be moderate. So if you can progress the slide forward. So with severe MPDR, if you have one severe sign, 15%, so something like one in seven patients will develop PDR by one year. If you have two of those signs, almost half of them will have PDR by one year. So PDRB is proliferative diabetic retinopathy. So these days in Australia, some retinal specialists will treat severe and PDR with PRP and not wait for them to develop P PDR. If the severe and PDR is showing signs of progression, and if you do fluorescein angiography and there's big areas of retinal non-perfusion, then some people start PRP then. Uh, strictly speaking, the guidelines are you treat with PRP once they have established PDR, but a lot of us will treat sooner than that. PDR, as you know, is then near vascularization of the anterior segment or the posterior segment or both. So that's the classification of diabetic retinopathy. Next slide. What about diabetic macular edema? So classification of DMO. In the old days, you know, 10 years ago or more, we used to talk about clinically significant macular edema. That's been simplified to some extent through the work of the DRCRNet, that research consortium that I mentioned. So diabetic macular edema now classified into center-involving and non-center-involving. So the top image there where you see the thickness map on the OCT, that's non-center-involving macular edema because the central subfield, one millimeter, is not involved. The bottom image the central one millimeter clearly is involved and that's center involving diabetic macular edema. Macular ischemia is separate. So you so you think of macular, diabetic maculopathy in terms of edema and, and, and ischemia. And you can actually have both coexisting. You can have edema and ischemia coexisting at the same time. Ischemia is better characterized with fluorescein angiography, if you can get that, with magnification of the central macula, say with a 30 degree lens, or if you have access to OCT angiography, that also demonstrates the foveal avascular zone very well. And you can compare it to the other eye, compare it to normal. Next slide. So here's some examples now. So here's fundus image, left eye, posterior pole. Definitely there's microaneurysms there. You can see that. There's also definitely intraretinal hemorrhages, so bigger than microaneurysms. So immediately you can say this is at least moderate NPDR. There's cotton wool spots inferiorly along the inferior arcade. Uh, and if you progress the slide, there's a few arrows that are used to. So there's your microaneurysms. Keep going. Uh, very likely has diabetic macular edema because you see the number of microaneurysms in the peripoveal area. And often they will be leaky. This could be an Irma. Um, and geography will help with that, and then cotton wool spots. So at least moderate, possibly severe, if you were to get a wider view of the fundus, and if you did fluorescein angiography. This one, uh, most of the action here is in the central macula. So there's a lot of hard exudate, which tells you there's leakage, and the foveal reflex is blunted. You can't see it very well. So this is a case of center-involving diabetic macular edema, and again, at least moderate non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy. Okay. So you think of you, you, the DR classification, you think of the DR itself and the DMO. And in some ways, they're sort of independent of each other.
So if you progress this, there should be some arrows or um, there we go. So here you have hard exudates. You can just make out the yellow infiltrates in the retina uh, and some hemorrhage, but they are not involving the, the central macula. So this is very likely to be non-center involving DMO. Next slide. And here, if you progress it, what you have here is peripapillary cotton wool spots. So cotton wool spot represents inner retinal ischemia. They're small areas of microvascular infarction. So just to demonstrate what they look like. Next slide. And here we have lots of signs. So this is great shot of venous beating, okay? So this is what I mean. When you examine the posterior pole, very quickly you can determine if there's venous beating or not. So this person has at least severe MPDR, but you already know you can see there's PRP laser scars. So they may well have PDR. And if you look at the disc, yes, you can see a little neovascular frond, clump of neovascular vessels at the optic disc. If you keep progressing, uh, and diabetic macular edema, keep progressing. The next arrow is pointing at deep intraretinal hemorrhage. So not superficial retinal hemorrhage, but the deep intraretinal hemorrhage is a sign of quite advanced ischemia, which fits with proliferative diabetic retinopathy. And finally, the PRP laser scars. You can see some of them are pigmented, so they were done some time ago, whereas the white ones are more recent. So this is probably a case of proliferative diabetic retinopathy with inadequate control, having had previous PRP. So we've more recently done fill-in PRP, coming in very close to, uh, you know, the main vascular arcade, as close as possible to the disc and the uh, vascular arcades, and including part of the macula as well. Okay, next slide. Okay, so the abnormality here, if you progress the slide, you'll see, look carefully, there's a high femur there. So in the absence of trauma, <clears throat> in the absence of recent surgery or uveitis, this is diabetic high femur. Uh, and if you look high magnification at the edge of the iris, you'll see there's rubiosis there. So if you progress the slide, you'll see I'm pointing to then the rubiotic vessels don't run radially. The physiological iris vessels run radially in the same direction as the iris sphincter muscles, whereas rubiosis tends to run along the margin of uh, the iris. Next slide. So therefore, what's needed in order to not, you know, to examine properly for diabetic retinopathy, you need a systematic approach and don't forget the anterior segment because you can have anterior segment new vascularization and causing glaucoma. So you don't want to miss that. Diabetics develop cataracts earlier. They also develop more sub posterior subcapsular cataracts. So you want to examine the lens. And then I go to the back, examine the disc. That's the most common site for new vascularization. And the venous beating is evident there. Then obviously the macula, the vascular arcades. If you advance the slide, I'll show you what I mean by the this is the posterior polar, what I call the posterior polar ring. Neovascularization very often happens in this area. Then if you advance again, these are the watershed zones. And one more time. So these are areas that are relatively underperfused, even in normal retina. So again, they're a common site for neovascularization. And then advance again. And then the far periphery, you can have a pattern of diabetic retinopathy where most of the lesions are far peripheral and the mid periphery and even the posterior pole can look you know kind of fairly normal or, or pretty unremarkable so you have to examine the very far periphery and that's the pattern that's called predominantly peripheral lesions ppl diabetic retinopathy with ppl so you need to do that and then you've got all your ancillary whatever you have access to photography is useful Fluorescein angiography, obviously, OCT, OCTA, if you have it, they can all be useful. Next slide. Okay, so look, that's clinical evaluation. We grade the retinopathy and we look for maculopathy, grade that if it exists. Now let's move on to management. Next slide. 
Let's start with the management of diabetic macular edema because the principle of management here is you manage maculopathy prior to managing PDR, if PDR is there. So <clears throat> the first question is, is there center involving DMO on OCT? Or, and or, is there PDR? If neither of those things is present, person doesn't need ophthalmic retinal treatment. They might need other ophthalmic treatment, but not retinal treatment. There is an argument for using macular laser, so focal laser or grid laser, for non-center involving DMO. And I definitely do that. The practice in Australia varies, but if you've got good vision, non-central involvement with DMO, that's a good candidate for macular laser. Now, what if there is center involving diabetic macular edema? There's a bit to talk about here. So these are the DRCRnet guidelines that I mentioned earlier. So if visual acuity is better than 69 or central subfield thickness is less than 300, you can observe, even if there's trace macular edema. <clears throat> if you're not sure if you're going to see the patient again, if close observation isn't possible, then you could use intravitreal therapy, IBT, right? So it just depends on the circumstances, but you don't have to treat this group. And again, macular laser could have a role if there's also a non-central element. If vision is worse than that, if we're now talking 69, 612, or central subfield thickness is more than anti-VEGF with any agent, once vision gets to 615 or worse, so this is DRCRnet, then it's ideally with a flibicept if you've got access to it. If you don't have access, any anti-VEGF agent. The protocol here in Australia is you start with six injections. So we, we've gone from loading with three to loading with six. We still load with three for um, mac macular degeneration, AMD. But here we load with six, sometimes five, five to six, let's say. And then you stop if it's stable over two or more visits. So what does stability mean? Less than a five-letter change or less than 10% change in central, central subfield thickness. If it gets worse, so they lose five letters, more than 10% macular thickening, resume the treatment. What if they're not responding? So you've done three to six injections and they're not responding. Well, if you have access to another anti-VEGF, then switch to a different anti-VEGF. If you switched and you've given them at least six injections, this is when corticosteroid becomes an option. So you can use intravitreal triencimolone, or if you have access to the dexamethasone implant, then that's an option. And then grid laser here is an option as well, because it was some of these ones that are really resistant to uh, intravitreal treatment, you sort of have no option but to use grid laser. So that's the general approach. Now, obviously, there'll be variations between patients, but that's the sort of blueprint, if you like, to how we approach diabetic macular edema here. Next slide. What about the doing the injections themselves? So if you can progress the slide. So what are the principles here? Ideally, you have a dedicated trip. So the so the principle here is safety. So you want you want to avoid endophthalmitis, as, as I'm sure you know. So what we aim for is a dedicated treatment room. You need to have a cleaning and disinfection protocol for that room. All the staff wear masks. Um, some practices will get the patients to wear masks. Minimize the number of people in the room. The room is not used for thoroughfare, so people aren't passing through the room to get to somewhere else. And then hand hygiene, antisepsis, all the usual stuff. Um, there's a variation in practice in Australia, whether we use speculum versus cotton bud, that can be discussed. Analgesia, everybody will use topical. Many of us use subconjunctival as well. And then you have your normal intravitreal injection technique, four millimeters or 4.5 millimeters from the limbus. What about macular laser? Well, this is for, mainly I use it for non-center involving diabetic macular edema with a macular lens, and you have to have a cooperative patient. You don't want to laser the fovea. So if you advance the slide, we'll go to the settings. So you use a small spot size here. 
if it's <clears throat> sort of juxtafovial, I use 50 microns. If I'm doing grid laser and it's further away from the center, at least a thousand microns, then I use a hundred micron spot size, low power, short duration, and you don't want it to the burns to be too close together. So at least one to two burn widths apart and no closer than a third of a disc diameter to the fovea in the disc. In practice, I'd probably stay further away than that half disc diameter from the fovea. With focal laser, you're, fog you're targeting focal leakage that's demonstrated on fluorescein. With grid laser, you're targeting areas of diffuse edema and you want a faint white burn. The burn should look a faint sort of white, should be visible, but not too bright. What about PRP laser? Well, what uh, we often do here these days is pre-treat with bevacizumab a week or two before PRP because PRP itself can induce vitreous hemorrhage. As the blood vessels, as the neovascular fronts contract, you can get some vitreous hemorrhage just from that. So often we'll pre-treat to reduce the risk of PRP and then you perform the PRP. Uh, I use a peribulbar block and won't go into all the details, but essentially it makes it much easier to do a large amount of laser in one visit without hurting the patient. So me and some retinal colleagues here now routinely do peribulbar block in clinic <clears throat> for PRP. And that works really well. And as far as the settings, if we advance the slide, so you're aiming for a minimum of 800 to 1,000. You know, I PRP'd the, somebody the other day was close to 1,500 burns. And you get on as much as possible for persistent disease. The spot size here is larger. So it's 400 microns at the retina, which means with the, the laser lens that I use, the machine is set on 200 microns because there's a doubling in uh, uh, the magnification of the spot size. <clears throat> I tend to start around 200 milliwatts and then go up or down based on the appearance of the laser burn. Um, I don't use multi-spot um, laser like the Pascal. I prefer to use single spot laser, but obviously multi-spot can work as well. And I titrate the duration based on uptake as well. And the spacing here is a bit closer than you would do for macular laser. So one spot size apart or even half a spot, spot size apart and avoid the, uh, the major vessels. Okay, next slide. So here's some examples of good PRP. So you can see very the, the, the spots aren't confluent. They don't cross over each other, but they're quite closely spaced. And uh, everything sort of anterior to the posterior pole in the, in the uh, wide field image has been lasered there. Next slide. So a few cases to discuss now. Um, this is a case of a 70 year old man, pseudophagic vision was down. He was last seen several years ago, hasn't been seen in a while. And the fundus is on first observation is somewhat unremarkable. But if before going to the fundus, you have a look at his anterior segment. Now, this isn't a particularly good image, unfortunately, but if you advance the slide, the, uh, if, you, if, if you were to look very closely, he's actually got anterior segment neovascularization here. Uh, if, you, if you go to the next slide now, it shows up. Yeah, in both those areas, so you see on fluorescein angiography, he clearly had rubiosis, almost six clock hours of rubiosis. So this is a profoundly ischemic eye. And... It, there's a variant of diabetic retinopathy which they can get what we call a featureless retina or featureless retinopathy, where it's so ischemic that the retina looks, you know, there's virtually no hemorrhage. There's not a lot going on. But the eye is so ischemic that you've developed you know, neovascularization of the iris. So this is just a reminder to start at the front when you're examining patients. Next slide. Next case is an Aboriginal lady, 69 years old. Poor vision in the right eye, 619, but very poor in the left eye. Type 2 diabetes. Poor vision in the left eye for some time. So it's not new. 
So immediately you have to think either it's vitreous hemorrhage or it's tractional detachment plus or minus cataract and DMO. <laughs> but 695, I'm worried about vitreous hemorrhage and, and tractional detachment. So next slide. If you look at the fundus, you see the left fundus, which is the lower one. Very hazy view. There's clearly vitreous hemorrhage there. There may be some vitreous hemorrhage in the right eye as well. You can see there's a bit of hemorrhage at the disc. Yeah, so if we go to the next slide, OCT. OCT of the right eye, there's a single large foveal cyst. Nothing terrible. So diabetic, central diabetic macular edema is not a big issue there. Looking at the left side, the, the nasal retina is raised which is in keeping with fibroneovascular frond forming there at the disc, which we're very suspicious of because you know there's a vitreous hemorrhage. So next slide. And here's fluorescent angiography, and you can see that there's a large neovascular net centered over the left optic disc, so there's NVD in both eyes. You can see the hyperfluorescence in the right eye, and in the left eye and the large area of neovascularization in the left eye. So this lady very likely is going to need vitrectomy plus anti-VEGF plus PRP, probably will have cataract extraction at the same time. The other thing to notice here is she's got macular ischemia in both eyes. So you can see the foveal avascular zone, the FAZ, it's enlarged and it's irregular. So her visual potential is going to be limited. So the prognosis here is guarded. The aim of treatment is going to be to preserve vision. Any visual gain here would be a, a bonus. Next slide. And here's wide field angiography. So I don't know how well the images show up on, on your screens, but particularly in the image of the right eye, you can see there are huge areas of capillary non-perfusion. So a very ischemic eye. The left eye is obscured by um, the hemorrhage. But uh, so this person needs full PRP as soon as possible, as well in both eyes, as well as vitrectomy in the left eye. <clears throat> Next slide. Next case is a 69-year-old man, again, not seen for a few years. So this is a common risk factor, isn't it? If, if people haven't been reviewed. He's, you know, we're told he's got mild NPDR, but he tells me he's due for uh, renal fistula to be uh, inserted. So if he's got end-stage renal failure, meaning he needs a fistula for hemodialysis, this is a red flag warning sign for more advanced retinopathy. So let's have a look at his fundi. So look, on first impression, yeah, there's no obvious vitreous hemorrhage. Doesn't seem to be much going on if you just take a quick look. But if you advance... You do fluorescein angiography, there's neovascularization everywhere, right? So you remember I talked about that posterior, posterior polar ring? So in that sort of distribution, just posterior to the mid-periphery, that's where he's developed neovascularization. And again, you can see big areas of capillary dropout in both eyes. So you also know he's going to need PRP in both eyes. Next slide. And if we go back... You know, if you take a quick look, you don't see anything. But if you take a close look, if you advance the slide, there's neovascularization there in the superior arcade of the right eye. And advance again, neovascularization at the disc. So it's all there if you look. And then fl fluorescein should really be confirming your suspicion. He, he doesn't have mild NPDR. Next slide. So there's full PRP to his right eye. Now, that PRP could be brought in further if it's needed. <laughs> so I'll generally bring it into about that level so it doesn't constrict visual field too much. But then if the PDR persists despite the initial PRP, then it can be brought in much closer, to almost to within a disc diameter of the disc on the nasal side and um, you know, probably another three disc diameters on the temporal side. Next slide. Same in the left eye. And you can see here the PRP itself has caused vitreous hemorrhage. So the patient has to be counseled beforehand. That And it tends to be a small vitreous hemorrhage, doesn't need vitrectomy, goes on its own. Next slide. 
Right. So we're at the end. Um, I rushed it a little bit because we because of the delay, but hopefully still useful. What are the principles here? We've been talking the whole time about ophthalmic management, but don't forget medical management. You know, prevention is better than cure. So we have to include the general practitioner, the endocrinologist, the nutritionist, where those people are available. HbA1c, cholesterol, blood pressure, they're the three important systemic risk factors for progression of diabetic retinopathy. That's the first thing. The second one is systematic history exam and imaging, so we don't miss things like some of the cases that we demonstrated and risk factors in the history that should alert us higher suspicion is longer duration of diabetic retinopathy, uh, higher HbA1c, or they don't know their HbA1c, poor renal function, uncontrolled blood pressure, and cholesterol. They're some of the risk factors. The principle of management is that we treat maculopathy before we treat proliferative diabetic retinopathy. Uh, the risk if you do, if you treat the PDR first, is that any existing DMO will become worse. So you sort of will go backwards vision-wise. So where it's available, anti-VEGF for center involving DMO, <clears throat> once the maculopathy is under controlled, then we treat with PRP. And the final point is don't forget the anterior segment. And also don't forget, yeah, the possibility of macular ischemia where the visual potential will be uh, limited uh, no matter what you do. Unfortunately, once ischemia has developed, the aim is to prevent them getting to that stage. So I believe that's my last slide. And uh, as a uh, Sana, a six-month-old, I couldn't help myself. I had to put that in. So I hope the talk was useful and, uh, yeah, happy to discuss or um, take any questions. So oh, thank you, Prof. Azafi. That's a very insightful and comprehensive lecture, I think. So maybe while waiting for um, one or two questions in the chat box, um, I would like to ask regarding mm. the diagnosis, the diagnostic tools that you mm. usually use. I saw that you use the FA a lot and you show cases um, mostly with FA, but in the real settings, how often do you perform FA and in what kind of case or patient do you use that? As we know that it's not without risk, right? Yeah, that's right. Look, FA, I think, is very, very useful and, pro and, and probably underused. So anybody uh, in my practice who's had diabetes for, for five years or more, I like to do a baseline FA on. And depending on the severity of the diabetic retinopathy, repeat the FA in certain number of years. And that really depends on how bad the, the retinopathy is. But the, the wide field FA in particular is extremely useful because sometimes it will show me things that I don't see myself on examination. If you've got an area of featureless retina, sometimes it's hard to know, is it completely ischemic? Or no, it's actually you know normal. So I, I find it a very useful tool. The rate of, comp you know, the most common side effect is nausea. Uh, I've never seen anaphylaxis. I've never seen true allergy. Of course, we know they happen, uh, but uh, it's very rare. Okay. Thank you, yeah. bro. Um, so we have one question from Dr. Valeri. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Valeri said that, um, thank you, Prof. Hassam. I would like to ask in patients with PDR and DMO, between laser and anti-VGF injection, how do you decide which treatment should be given first? What is the Look, consideration? Look, always uh, anti-VGF first. Mm -hmm. And another one of the clinical trials done by DRCRNet showed that PDR can be adequately controlled by anti-VGF alone, no PRP. So a few years ago, School of Thought developed that, hey, even if they have PDR, just treat with anti-VEGF. Now, the problem with that is that's ongoing, indefinite, potentially lifelong intravitreal injections. It's a lot of burden on the patient. It's uh, a lot of cost for the patient and for the healthcare system. So I reject the idea of forever 
treating PDR with anti VEGF. But the good news is, if you have someone with PDR and DMO, if you just start your anti VEGF, you know you're treating both. You're actually going to be treating both. So I persist with anti VEGF until the edema is gone, or if they've got some vitreous hemorrhage, until the vitreous hemorrhage has cleared enough that I can get my start to get my PRP on. That might take three treatments, might take six. Yeah. Thank you, Prof. So is there any opinion regarding uh, this, maybe from our consultants? Yes, um, I, uh, I agree with uh, Professor Azafi. I think, uh, yes, in, in our practice also, some um, VR doctors from other regions or other countries would start to ad adopt the uh, monotherapy, anti-FEGF anti monotherapy for even for PDR. But uh, yeah, I think uh, that caused a lot of burden. Yeah, I mean, doing injections itself is a, a costly uh, medication and also a risk of, mm, yeah, the discomfort and also the risk of infection. Uh, we have the issue of scheduling also and uh, it is time tested, I guess, the the PRP treatment mm -hmm. uh, that it could stabilize the retina, may, make the retina dry, and at least uh, that can uh, solve one problem for the diabetic retinopathy management. And we just have to deal with the with the macular edema. Yeah, probably if the edema recurs, then we could uh, do the injections uh, without. Uh, worrying about uh, uh, the reoccurrence of neovascularization. Yeah, I agree with that. That's where where I do you think, sorry, please go on. No, no, I'm, I'm finished. <laughs> okay. Yeah, where, where I think anti vegf has a role with PDR is if they've had full PRP, okay, full PRP has been done, but the PDR is still active. So occasionally it causes a vitreous hemorrhage. So that person, I'll and we all have these as retinal people, that person I'll give them bevacizumab, avastin, just every so often, just enough to keep that neovascular vessel, reduce its leakiness, basically, so that you don't get the breakthrough vitreous hemorrhage. It might be two injections a year. I've got a handful of patients, I give them two avastin a year, just prevent vitreous hemorrhage. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Prof. So we have another question here from Dr. Firna um, asking about the role of OCTA, the OCT angiography. Um, is it um, able to replace the FA or is there any place to do it in some cases? What do you think, Prof? <laughs> Can't replace FA because it doesn't show leakage at this point. In diabetic macular edema, it's useful for macular ischemia or demonstrating macular ischemia. That's about it. Um, in AMD and other diseases, there you use it to demonstrate neovascularization. And so, but different disease, right? Mm -hmm. uh, in diabetic um, retinopathy, where you have somebody who doesn't have lots of macular thickening, or even if they do, you want to visualize the foveal vascular zone as well as possible. And if you can do that with fluorescein, great but OCTA can help. Okay. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you, Prof. So is there any um, more addition or command from uh, other consultants? Or we can move to the next question, Prof. Um, what do you think of the evidence of regard regarding the new uh, injection, the Febismo? Uh, do you use it? Um, and for what kind of patients? Yeah. So the Bismo became available in Australia last year, January 2023. I immediately started using it on patients with DMO and with AMD, neovascular AMD, who I could not extend beyond four weeks. So they have very resistant disease. You have to treat them every four weeks forever. So the clinical trials showed that large proportion of those patients, you can extend them to eight weeks, even 12 weeks, right? In the real world, uh, the results have not been as good, especially for DMO. 
So anecdotally, most of retinal specialists in Australia will say Babismo versus a flibercept, no advantage for DMO. For neovascular AMD, different. Seems to be more effective for AMD. So four weeks might become six weeks, even seven, eight weeks. But for DMO, unfortunately, it hasn't made a big difference. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Um, is there any other uh, experience with Fabismo, maybe? Yeah, Fabismo was just launched uh, November last year, so uh, not yet six months. And uh, I think uh, I myself has uh, attempted to use uh, first in AMD patients, but uh, because of the very high price, uh, I think uh, we still have limited experience. A lot of patients would just retreat. Uh, why don't you give me the old ones, doc? <laughs> Because it's very expensive, so uh, yeah. But some of my, uh, I know that uh, some VR doctors have started to use. Uh, but uh, regarding the superiority, uh, I, I don't think there's uh, any reports yet. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I think if uh, it, it primarily used uh, in patients who uh, has not proven to be responsive. Uh, after aflibercept treatment, yeah, and mostly in AMD cases. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So thank you, Doctor uh, Gita, um, Professor Zafi. I think we now have um over our time. Sure. Uh, so can I conclude the meeting? So Please. yes. It's very nice to have your lecture and the cases and also the uh, discussion. Thank you, Dr. Gita, Dr. Mario, and all other consultants. And I would like to invite all of the participants, presenters, uh, everyone joining in uh, now to open the video, if you can, so we can have a photo, right? So Dr. Miki, can you help us to um, have a shot? Uh, yes, Dr. Mita. <laughs> Uh, good evening, everyone. I would like to invite all of you to open up your camera so that we could begin our photo session shortly. Guys, while you're doing that, can I just, something worth mentioning, Arti, if I can. Yes. In Australia, it's likely that later this year, there will be a new um, preparation of a flibercept mm -hmm. that, will, that will likely be approved for use, which is eight milligrams. So the current aflibercept is two milligrams. This one will be four times the dose. And again, clinical trial results are outstanding mm. for its use. We all have a bit of skepticism now about clinical trial versus real world. Mm -hmm. But because it's such a good drug, it's going to be really interesting to see what the eight milligrams does for diabetic macular edema. Wow. Yeah. Yes, good. Thank you, Prof. Uh, we will wait so for the... Uh real result in the real, real world. world, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So, uh, Dr. Miki, can you start to take the photo? Or have uh, you... Okay. Oh, right. okay. <laughs> okay, everyone. Now I'm uh, beginning to take our photo. So give us your best smile. One, two, three. Okay, second page. One, two, three. Third page, one, two, three. Fourth page, one, two, three. And last one, one, two, three. Okay, all done, Dr. Mita, back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Miki. Thank you, everyone. Hope to see you again next month. We will have the topic of uveitis, I think, next month. So uh, thank you and have a good night. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, professors. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Thank you so much. Thank you so much, everyone. Very good Thank lecture. Thanks so much. Very nice lecture. Thank you, Prof, for your lecture. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.